Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them uh, in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and on today's episode, we will discuss about some fundamental questions <laughs> that... Uh, that are looking how capitalism and rationalism has altered our relationship with nature, which in turn is responsible for a number of our current environmental crises. In other words, we'll look whether the duality between separating nature and society, which we always use as a given in my field uh, when we account for flows, is actually one of the root causes uh, for the situation we're in. We'll question whether the right way to qualify the epoch we're living in is capitalocene instead of anthropocene. And finally, we will try to see together whether there is another uh, sociological future that we would like to co-create or foresee. To talk about these big topics, I have uh, Jason W. Moore. Uh, Jason is an environmental historian and historical geographer at Binghamton University. Uh, he's professor of sociology over there, and he's the author of Capitalism in the Web of Life, Ecology and the Accumulation of Capital. Um, he's also the editor of Anthropocene or Capitalocene, uh, Nature, History, and the Crisis of uh, Capitalism. And he also co-authored with Rash Patel, another fantastic book. Um, his books are trying to make the synthesis between the radical scholarship, well, red and green, let's say, um, by looking at the long-term perspective of capitalism, power, and nature. And he also coordinates the Word Ecology Research Network. We'll learn about Word Ecology in a minute. Just before we kick off the episode, I'd like to make a small request from, uh, from you uh, that are watching and listening. If you like this episode, please share it around with your friends, colleagues, and family. I think a number of people are going to enjoy it. And it's the best way to support this, this small podcast that is quite niche, but I think a number of you will enjoy it. With all that being said, welcome, Jason. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks so much. A pleasure to be here, Aristide. Great. Um, so, of course, I think for you to arrive to, to analyze, to theorize, and to develop such notions, there has been a small journey, I guess, between geography, history, sociology. How do we arrive into this topics of capitalism, word ecology, and such? Well, so there are two questions here. One is the question about the disciplines. And the other is the question about the, the capital and the capital scene. So why don't we do the disciplines first, and then we you can uh, interrupt me and push me in this direction, in that direction. So first, let's be clear that the disciplines are called disciplines because they discipline intellectuals. They control and contain and channel intellectuals and intellectual life into acceptable forms of scholarship. And so you mentioned my journey, which involves uh, a PhD in geography. I'm really a, uh, um, in the lineage of an urban, I don't know if I wanna say urban centered, uh, but uh, urban influenced historical geographical materialism. Uh, I'm in the lineage of David Harvey, Richard Walker, uh, I uh, work uh, uh, and, uh, uh, intellectually, I see myself as a, as a co-collaborator with people like Neil Brenner and the planetary urbanization thesis that takes urbanization as a class environmental spatial process, political process as a dialectical whole. And so that defies disciplinary boundaries. Mm -hmm. However, what we see in the established disciplines are something, it's a situation that resembles the parable of the blind men and the elephant. And one blind man finds a tree trunk, another finds a wall, another finds a rope. And so what we see, for instance, in historical geographical materialism is uh, uh, coming out of geography is that it's not very historical. However, if you flip, uh, flip it on the other side, world history and environmental history and climate history in particular, 
maintains considerable distance from historical geographical materialism of any kind, the critique of capitalism. And we can do that across the different disciplines. Some understand class better than others, sociology in general better than geography. So this is not a call, my own journey, intellectual journey, suggests not the need for multidisciplinarity, which is a problem, which is a huge problem. It essentially reinforces the problem of the disciplines, but rather an argument uh, for transcending the disciplinary boundaries. Now that's a problem. I mean, that's a political problem, not just an intellectual problem. Universities love to talk about going beyond disciplines. None of them mean it. Funding agencies love to talk about interdisciplinarity. None of them mean it. And there, we have to look at this as not just a problem of, oh, well, some scholars identify as geographers or sociologists or urbanists or agrarian studies scholars. That's a symptom of the, of the deeper problem. The deeper problem goes to something that you telegraphed in your opening remarks, which are nature versus society and the larger structures of knowledge in the modern world system, which is a capitalist world ecology. I'll talk about that in a moment. But essentially, the structures of knowledge, most obviously the two cultures of the human and natural sciences, but we can break those down into their constitutive moments. Most notably, this nature society boundary is not just a structure of knowledge, it is a strategy of power. Mm. And so until intellectuals within universities, which are in fact knowledge factories, we should, we should emphasize that universities are corporations. They don't, they're not beholden to the stock market, but in many cases, they may as well be. And, yeah, but they, they don't uh, uh, say that to themselves. That's the, the, the interesting duality right now, yeah. Well, they have to because... Yeah. Uh, part of what knowledge factories do is not just produce uh, appropriately skilled and, and appropriately obedient students, but also they socialize intellectuals so that they behave in acceptable ways. And uh, it's, uh, you know, this is not the agora of ideas. <laughs> this is uh, a machine. And like any factory-like situation, there are multiple opportunities for struggle. But the universities have to say this because they have to socialize the intellect workers within the academy to behave in appropriate ways and to not raise uncomfortable questions. And I don't mean uncomfortable like everybody's supposed to be a vegan. I mean uncomfortable in terms of, well, how does savings and investment work in capitalist civilization and doesn't need to be fundamentally reimagined in a democratic way. So in some this my own journey through the disciplines has taught me that the disciplines are part of the problem. And I mean no disrespect to people who, for quite reasonable uh, uh, biographical and social factors, mm -hmm. identify and they say, well, I'm an urbanist, I'm a geographer. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between a lowercase g geographer <laughs> and an uppercase g geographer or go down the list, right? Those uh, and and so we've all we've all been in rooms and conferences where people say, well, as an economist, yeah. as a political <laughs> scientist, from and, uh, this point of view. Yeah, right. And that's that's the moment where you hear somebody has run out of ideas and they are arguing from the point of view of authority. Now, I might say as a world historian, this is what we've learned, but I would not make that as a special claim uh, mm. to expertise, only a particular vantage point, one of, of many vantage points that is compatible with many other vantage points, as we'll see. So in some, we need to go beyond the safe and predictable and acceptable critique of epistemologies and disciplines to understand the disciplines are, in fact, historically, in quite palpable ways, ideological structures and mechanisms to manufacture consent. And yes, there are dissidents and there, there is a counter tendency. The structures of knowledge and the structures of power and the structures of capital are all dialectically joined to each other. Yeah, we're starting strong, good. Uh, because, that, well, I have always this challenge as well to, to define myself or in which conference do you go or how do you, you know, you always feel left out somehow or you, you are the, the Venn diagram of 
many things and somehow you, you try to 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 be the the fitting piece uh, of, of all of that and and it's well wonderful because you learn from everything but at the same time exhausting because you you feel uncomfortable all the time um but and i think th therefore okay if if we start discussing eventually for what one central topic uh which would be capitalism for instance how, how do we how do we frame capitalism because you know, and a number of our, of our discussion uh, or a number of the questions and what we're going to say is going to be around capitalism. I think we, we need to start from the basis in order to to build upon it. So is it, it's not a disciplinary then point of view. What what do we do with this, right? What are the theoretical tools? You are looking this from the long durée, such as, uh, I guess, Brodel or, or people like that, or from the word systems point of view from Wallerstein. How do we understand this this economic system is it an economic system what is it well it's a system of class power that includes an economic logic but is not reducible to it so to regard capitalism as an economic system is fundamentally a bourgeois procedure this has been recognized for uh, explicitly for the whole 20th century this was uh, the great hungarian marxist jorge uh, lukács who said you know, the primacy of economic motives is not what distinguishes Marxism. What distinguishes historical materialism is the point of view of totality. Now, when we say this, let me make clear, the point of view of totality does not say we include everything and we, we try to do everything. Now, as intellectuals, uh, I'm sure you and many of our uh, the, the listeners will uh, relate to the curiosity that mm -hmm. is licensed by dialectics, that we want to understand how everything is connected to everything else. But the point of view of totality is an intellectual procedure. And this is very important because there are many forms of post-structuralism that essentially are, are carrying water for neoliberalism that say Marxism is irreducibly totalizing and universalizing. Mm -hmm. This is especially the line of critique that comes out of um, the decolonial thought associated with people like uh, Arturo Escobar and Walter Mignolo, not not Quijano. Uh, so we need to write because they basically threw out Quijano's uh, world historical geographical materialism uh, because it was inconvenient for their, uh, their post-structuralist, anti-historical, anti-Marxist and anti-communist perspective. Anyway, uh, we want to be clear that looking at totalities is a historical geographical procedure. It's not a universalist claim. It's dialectical universalism, if you will, as opposed to the bourgeois universalism of, uh, of capitalist ruling ideas from the very beginning. Now, I use that term ruling ideas because for me, the lineage is to Marx and Engels and the foundational statements of historical materialism. I do so not out of a sense of histor of theoretical orthodoxy, whatever that means. We should go. We should all go back to the German ideology, and we should see what. Just they're one actually... question uh, with um, historical yes. materialism. What, what do yes. you have in mind when you when you use this? Well, I sense? what I have in mind is the lineage that goes back to the to the German ideology. In fact, mm. and here we have several key ideas, not just the materialist conception of class society. That's one of them. But note how Marx and Engels in the German ideology begin. They begin with what they call natural conditions and, and their subsequent modification in the course of the development of class society. In other words, this is an argument for class society in the web of life. Class society, and we know this, this is an urbanization uh, 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 podcast, we know this because the origins of class and cities go hand in hand in, let us say, uh, late Chalcolithic, Copper Age, and early Bronze Age um, human history. We can go down the rabbit hole in this, but essentially, as Peter Taylor and others have rightly elaborated Child's famous thesis, uh, class formation and class structure really achieves its mature form in early cities. 
Now, what counts as a city and what doesn't, that's, that's a more technical discussion. But these two moments go together. And, and how do they reproduce themselves? Well, uh, uh, Neil Brenner and his colleagues give us operational landscapes. And that's basically right. Uh, um, Scott, James Scott, calls them state landscaping. And as an anarchist, he wants to say it's more or less all state driven, but the state is an instrument of power for the ruling class. Yes, there are contradictions, of course, in that. And there's class struggle, of course, in that process. Nevertheless, what Marx and Engels give us is an account of class society in the web of life. It's a materialist critique. It's a materialist critique that takes ideology seriously. And so they argue something quite robust which is that every ruling class must generate essentially another auxiliary class to produce ideas, ruling ideas for them. <coughs> These are what are variously called intellect workers. Today, they're sometimes referred to as the professional managerial class. Uh, they certainly include professors alongside um, policymakers and uh, some, some journalists, et cetera. This means that a historical geographical materialism takes class society in the web of life seriously and understands that classes do not rule by materialist uh, practices alone, except insofar as we regard, again, with Marx, that ideas themselves are material forces. That's a direct paraphrase. And so I don't say this out of any um, orthodoxy, but to clear up the confusion that a vulgar materialism represents historical materialism, which it clearly does not, and which Marx and Engels, from the very beginning, I mean, remember, they're writing the German ideology in their 20s, um, and they carry this line of thought all the way through, and oh, by the way, they are also insisting from the very beginning, not on society and nature, but on the relations of humans to the rest of nature. What is human labor, they ask? Human labor is, and I quote from the Grundrisse, a specifically harnessed natural force. And so if we want to understand the long durée of urbanization, which is also the long durée of class society and state formation, then we need to take seriously what I've called the environmental, environment making dynamic of these processes. And I'll pause here in just a moment, but let me um, close this loop. Environment making means that environments are both producers and products of class society over the long durée. And that environment making uh, is a dialectic, if you will, uh, that that Marx basically summarizes in the most ex one of the most extraordinary passages in Capital. It's the first page of the chapter on the labor process where he makes very clear, there's a metabolism. There's a metabolism that is a metabolism of class power, right? That's, he's beginning this, this chapter uh, in order to talk about class struggle. It's, it, it's on the labor process. And so metabolism is a class struggle in which uh, internal nature or humans transform environments, the environments transform humans, and the relationship itself, which is a metabolic relationship, is transformed. If we take that seriously, which most Marxists don't, but if we take it seriously, then we can say this about however you want to use whatever meta category you want. I would civilization, class society, I would see those as more or less interchangeable that civilizations produce environments through various labor processes, and the environments are transforming those civilizations in part through those labor-centered transformations, but also in part through climatological shifts that are the result of natural forcing and uh, essentially random events like volcanic activities. Uh, we don't wanna, we don't want to, um, uh, as humanists, uh, they don't want to make too much of volcanism, but in fact, volcanic eruptions have fundamentally shaped the course of human history. And uh, I say this because there are many critics who say, oh, well, Moore is just a social constructionist. He's an idealist. He doesn't really care about the web of life. Um, but I don't see them writing about the history of volcanism in the history of class society or the history of capitalism. So let's be aware that saying there's an environment making dynamic doesn't mean that there aren't essentially elements of natural forcing, including solar fluctuations in solar energy reaching the earth, orbital variations, the precession and recession, the earth wobble, uh, uh, in other words, uh, matters quite a bit. All of these factors are hugely significant. 
And uh, uh, of course, regardless of whether there's a class society or peasant communism or something entirely different, uh, volcanoes will erupt. Uh, the solar there will be solar minima and maxima, and that's really uh, uh, that's really important to keep in mind too. That essentially webs of life are uncontrollable, but the ways in which class societies have sought to control environments uh, implies a dialectic of class urbanization, politics, and environmental change across the very long durée. So that's the insight for me that informs capitalism. And just one note that we can follow up on is that it's become acceptable to talk about capitalism as a system, uh, but, and it's a very important but, uh, we go back to the knowledge factory, which has established essentially an intellectual no-fly zone around capitalism as a class society, and, and uh, a refusal and a systematic discouragement of intellectuals from investigating, say, climate change as fundamentally a class project, as a capitalogenic that is made by capital uh, historical process. We can't talk about class. And that's really, really dangerous in the present moment of climate crisis. Okay, so I'm trying to, I'm going to take the excuse of, uh, of the audience to, to clarify some points. Excellent. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, so that there is Capitalism is some form of a class society that has specific rules, be it on, on labor, on nature, and other elements. And capitalism, capitalist civilization invents nature. Now, what does that mean? Uh -huh. Oh, more yeah. as being a social constructionist. No, in fact, and this is this is where eco-socialists go terribly, terribly, terribly wrong because they don't know about history. And as near as I can tell, there's very little interest in world history. There is a long and fairly uncontroversial history of ideas, which makes clear, for instance, that Western civilization, and indeed the notion of civilization, is not invented until fairly late. Western civilization doesn't enter uh, the discourse and, and capitalism's mode of thought until the 18th century. Civilization uh, enters into Western European languages in the century between 1550 and 1700, along with what other words? Uh, nature, society. Um, savage gets, uh, the meaning gets re-signified. Savage in the Middle Ages meant something fierce and noble. And, and there's an oscillation, sometimes that's used, but by and large, the way that early capitalist conquerors saw the world, uh, certainly the new world, was in terms of civilization and savagery, which is what today we call civilization and nature. Now, some people say, do we really need to know this intellectual and philosophical history in order to make sense of climate justice politics? The answer is an emphatic yes. And let me just give you the shortest snippet of this uh, uh, argument, that when John Locke writes the Constitution for the Carolinas at, at the end of the 17th century, which by the way, is in the midst of the greatest climate crisis until now that capitalism faced, the worst of the long, of the, the little ice age. But he writes his constitution that amongst other things forbids English settlers from entering into contracts with indigenous peoples. Why? Well, we know this sort of, but we don't appreciate its significance because indigenous peoples lived in a state of nature. They were savage. What was the significance of that, the practical significance of that? Well, savage people could not improve, improve with an uppercase I, improve the land in a capitalist fashion. Hmm. Or it, he didn't say capitalist, but improve it to ensure productivity and uh, um, economic growth and, and all the rest. I'm paraphrasing. And so therefore, settlers' historical mission was to improve the land, something that the savage indigenous peoples who lived in a state of nature could not do. Now, are we to say that property, bourgeois property, and the whole geocultural apparatus of climate apartheid, climate patriarchy, or, and, and the climate class divide organized around bourgeois property and its imperial conditions of protecting, justifying, and defending are beside the point? Of course not. Nobody would say that. 
But this is an example of how bourgeois thought and nature society dualism has essentially short circuited the historical imagination of the left today. And the many scholars who regard themselves as critical and say, well, uh, I read a, a, a fine piece in some ways, but a very destructive piece in others in, in the, the conversation, the website, the conversation, where the fellow said, well, the Anthropocene is problematic, but at least it raises awareness. Well, it the raises- The term or, or what? Or the, the it raises awareness of the climate crisis. This okay, is the same yeah. thing that people have been saying since the first Earth Day, the first uh, UN conference in Stockholm in 72. Well, it raises awareness. Well, yes, indeed, it raises awareness uh, in the same way that Malthus uh, helped uh, re-justify class divisions in late 18th century England. Um, it completely evacuates the central questions of power, class, capital, and empire in the modern world. The Anthropocene and I don't mean the geologists, we can get into the nitty gritty of golden spikes, and that's an interesting discussion. But everyone else who's not a geologist is basically a Neo-Malthusian and using Neo-Malthusian language when they invoke the Anthropocene. It is what the great uh, uh, development sociologist, uh, political scientist James Ferguson calls an anti-politics machine, right? It evacuates the, uh, the conditions of politics and inserts what? A managerial imperative. So that's very crucial. The history and the politics have to be regarded as much more intimately connected. And I think that connects with your first question about the disciplines and my point mm. about the violence of the discipline, which is related to practical violence as well. When you distinguish history with word history, could you explain what it entails? Well, I invoke world history as a point of emphasis. So history as a discipline does contain some world historians. Uh, I know I'm very uh, good friends with some of them. They're brilliant, they're intrepid. But in the main, uh, world history is a, is a teaching and not research field within uh, the discipline. In fact, the discipline active, the discipline now sort of encourages things like transnational history and this and that. But world history speaks to uh, uh, the world historical imagination that, and I'm, I'm sorry to sound like a, a, an old guard Marxist here, but then Marx and Engels point out, especially in relation to the history of the modern world, which is that the dynamic of capitalism renders everyday life increasingly a world historical event. We all know this and recognize this at some level, that the clothes we wear, the computers we use, the uh, uh, stoves we cook upon, these are all uh, uh, manufactured elsewhere in the world, uh, by and large, or manufactured through uh, the global assembly line. And that's, that's important, but it's also important when we recognize that, as I like to say, for instance, 1492 never ended. And in rich countries with no experience of imperialism, they always look at me quizzically. I lived in Sweden for many years. It was a wonderful experience and they couldn't wrap their minds around it. And we can also say this in other ways. We can say that 1648 concluding the, the, the 30 years war never ended. We can go through this in many different ways. Uh, but the, the world historical imagination defies the binary of past and present, knits them together. I think that's Wallerstein's contribution, the work of Emmanuel Wallerstein. Everyone uh, uses a phrase like world systems, like it says something. Uh, people forget that Wallerstein was always an anti-systemic thinker. Uh, they're always okay. a dialectical thinker, right? They, they mix them up with systems theory uh -huh. and uh, the systems theory of limits to growth of Jay Forrester, uh, that kind of, uh, you probably know him in urbanization through urban dynamics, which uh, as one of my uh, students, uh, Mar Maria Radovanovich points out, comes directly out of the urban unrest in the United States in the late 1960s, right? So systems thinking is a managerial uh, philosophy mm. and was directed towards managing problems on the battlefield, in the factories, in the cities, and then on a planetary basis. But anyway, what we wanna do is start to link together past and present and to understand not only did 1492 never ended, but we also need to get rid of this Anthropocene epic garbage even in a geological term, and start to talk about what 
Rudd well, uh, William Ruddeman and uh, uh, Simon Lewis, Mark Maslin and others are saying is an Anthropocene event that the Holocene already implied and necessitated um, and, and recognized human action. It was, it was, that was already in play 150 years ago, right? Mm. So very old wine in a somewhat new bottle and not even that new a bottle, but, but there's, a, there's a more interesting point, which is that the origins of urbanization, state formation and class society also, and this is what Ruddeman points out in the so-called Ruddeman or early anthropogenic hypothesis point out that essentially what we're seeing is that class society stabilizes the Holocene and prevents a reversion to an ice age um, in the in the along the same time frame as previous interglacial periods between glacial maximums, that is. So class society creates the conditions. This is not Rediman doesn't say class society. He's a very much a, a Malthusian in this sense, um, uh, focusing on population dynamics. But if you look at the history, you can see the class societies drive. Uh, population dynamics. Class societies are very pronatalist in all sorts of ways. The left has abandoned the historical critique of, of population dynamics by and large. So we don't know this, but I'm saying it here that the Holocene, this interglacial period we are living in, is made possible by class society, which essentially arrests the decline in car and atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, meth methane as well, and uh, then brings them back up to levels around 270, 260 parts per million and creates this remarkably stable climate over the whole Holocene. Now, are there Anthropocene events throughout? Yes, but let's really start to focus on the ideological consequences, uh, not just of the popular version of the Anthropocene, but also the geological uh, version. And those scientists, they always take refuge in the authority and expertise of science, but they're not afraid to violate the boundaries and to uh, uh, elaborate and wax on uh, at length about human history, um, mm -hmm. right? And, and so there's a real arrogance there that's accompanied by a lack, of, as arrogance often is, a lack of, of reflexivity and reflectivity. So here, these are ways of beginning to see how the point of view of totality, as I invoked from historical materialism and Lukács and Marx and everyone else, is a way to begin to see what is not there in the dominant environmental conceptions of our era, the Holocene, the Anthropocene, the danger of climate, uh, the arguments that, uh, uh, for instance, as the Journal of Peasant Studies uh, editors recently said, human-made climate change poses an existential threat, uh, which is about as Malthusian a, a statement as you can get. It says, you know, human-made, no, it's not human-made, it's uh, class made, it's driven by capitalism, the, the climate crisis, and the, the existential threat is not by, from climate change, it's from the class project of the imperial bourgeoisie over the past 500 years. And that's situated within the longer arc of the Holocene from, let us say, more or less uh, somewhere around 6000 BCE. And so we want to really start to test all of these propositions, but we can't test these propositions because uh, uh, the universities are set up to foreclose the, uh, the uh, opportunities to do so unless you wanna go off and uh, uh, go in the wilderness, which is I think what a lot of us um, need to do. And then we need to build solidarity so we can uh, uh, you know, maybe surround the cities from the countryside as Lin Piao used to say. Yeah, that's, that's a great reference for, for an urbanization podcast. Is it? Yeah, <laughs> Lin Piao needs to be referenced. Um, surround the cities. It's funny, yeah, how indeed, yeah, this whole, well, th this whole layers and how much we need to know before we speak as well. And, you know, it kind of, you know, you, how humble you need to be before saying anything out. And it, it seems, I mean, you, you went from 6000 BCE to, you know, the, the Renaissance and then back and forth and all that. And I think there, there are elements here and there and, and hints here and there that are interesting. But the thing is, how do you link them? Um, and, you know, there is, of course, this, 
this idea that you might have your own bias and therefore you link them as such, you know, at posteriori rather than mm -hmm. um, on the other way around, so are for serious or something like that. So I, exactly. I I love this way of being able to to look at hints over time and try to to make sense and also putting things into relationship. But how do you know when you read them? How when you look at them, especially as you say that history, this discipline is is always also taught by the winners and all of that. So there's so many things that we don't know. So how do you go about in this, you know, immense wealth of knowledge and therefore somehow forming a, a story or, or something to say? Well, this is where historical materialism is so valuable. Remember what Marx uh, says in, in the, uh, uh, the thesis on Feuerbach, that philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it. Now, that does not mean we don't need philosophy. It means that we need philosophy to change the world. And in order to change the world, we need uh, to have a historical materialist conception. So the crucible of knowledge in this conception is praxis. Hmm. And uh, there's no, uh, you know, bedrock Procrustean bed of truth that we can get to if only we can uh, remove our biases. Um, and, and bias only makes sense in relation, this is not what you're saying at all, of course, but bias only makes sense in relation to a positivist, objectivist, uh, bourgeois notion of truth. Mm. Uh, uh, so we have tools to do this. One is history. And in a conversation like this, it's very difficult to unpack and test very large uh, conceptual propositions against the nitty gritty of historical geographical experience. I think that podcasts are less suitable for that and uh, written texts are more. And I've mm. tried to the best of my ability to do that. So you kindly mentioned my capitalism in the web of life, which in, in my view is unusual and I think has elicited both appreciation and controversy <laughs> because it's hard to understand, it's hard to locate the genre of the book. And the genre of uh, the, because the book def engages political theory, engages philosophical anthropology very, very seriously, philosophies of nature very seriously, and is also a theoretical book about capital accumulation and is also a world history. So there is not a paragraph of conceptual, theoretical, or philosophical argument in that book that is not almost immediately followed with a historical illustration. Now, the historical illustrations do not prove or disprove the point. What do they do? They illuminate the plausibility of the line of thought mm. so that we can, oh, that's what arguments for new paradigms do. Now, whether this is successful or not, that's another question, but, but how do we dialectically weave together these genres so that we explode the genres of, um, of, of a given field, like in urbanization. This is why Neil Brenner and his colleagues have elicited so much attack because they are saying that it's not, that methodological cityism is not the way to go. In fact, there is a wider uh, geography of urbanization that has to be taken very seriously. So, it, and they're illuminating the plausibility of that paradigm shift which I see is absolutely not just cognate to, but contributory to and complementary to the world ecology conversation. So in that light, uh, first of all, praxis, it's both scholarly praxis, like do you have conceptual models that undergo qualitative transformation through the course of a study? So are you, in other words, are you, be, are you ending a study, whether it's a set of articles or a book, with the same ideas that you began it with. And this is actually a problem with some of the most prominent uh, mischaracterizations of my work. I have the sense that they read the first 30 pages and then sort of did a PDF, a keyword search for everything else and cherry pick their, their phrases. But if you look, for instance, at, at how I begin the web of life is with a discussion of how do we understand not humans as part of nature, Everybody agrees on that. That's not, that's not the argument, but human collectivities, human organizations, families, farms, financial systems, uh, empires, uh, civilizations as producing changes in the web of life, but also products of those changes in the web of life. How do we conceptualize 
that double internality. That is webs of life are inside human organization and human organization is inside webs of life. That doesn't deny the autonomy of those wider webs of life, as I mentioned with my example of the Earth's orbital variations or volcanic eruptions, both hugely important, by the way, in human history. In any event, uh, so, so what, what I do there is to establish a, uh, what Marx calls a guiding thread. And then where I end is by making an argument about capitalism's relationship to the climate crisis that is at least on the surface absolutely identical to those of rival, rival eco-socialist uh, interpreters, uh, which is that the climate crisis is indeed a fundamental and insuperable barrier to the reproduction of capitalism as we've known it. Now, what I say again and again and again is that what world ecology helps us see is not the what. The what has already been, I think, well documented. Yes, there is a real climate crisis. Yes, it involves um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, but also what I've called the trinity of the climate class divide, climate patriarchy, climate apartheid, something they don't say, uh, but I do because it's so fundamental. We have to put these two moments together, but also that we have to understand the specific mechanics of how capitalism has fixed its own climate and other environmentally related crises over the long durée to produce insuperable limits that then lead in several possible directions, one of which is a kind of techno-scientific world economic forum, great reset uh, uh, vision of the world. Another is some ill-defined still uh, Chinese Belt and Road um, strategy. Another is uh, 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 includes a family of popular alternatives, democratic alternatives, much of which I think are very starry-eyed because they don't deal with history. Um, but essentially, that's an example of the power of dialectics and getting to the point that you just asked about, which is how do we know this is useful? Well, does your conceptual and methodological and historical apparatus lead you to surprising and unexpected conclusions at the end of a particular phase of your study? And I think if the answer is yes, then uh, that's, that's as good a test of scholarly praxis as any. And of course, there are wider political issues we can talk about. But in terms of scholarly praxis, I think, I think bourgeois thought teaches us to be relentlessly, you use the word humble, and I think every intellectual who is deeply curious is humble. I think that in the bourgeois academy, uh, uh, the, the dynamics of labor are what they call academic alienated labor. And they induce, encourage, and enable forms of anxiety and insecurity that go beyond normal self-doubt. And they do it in a lot of different mechanisms, not least through this absolutely authoritarian exercise of, of expertise, right? You have the senior professors who say, well, I know this, and they're gonna, they're gonna uh, uh, force people to agree with them or drive them away. Now, I mean, there are many, many exceptions, and I'm here as a result of many senior faculty who license me to do this crazy heterodox uh, <laughs> journey that I'm upon, all right? So I wanna give them uh, uh, credit people like Giovanni Rigi and Richard Walker and David Harvey and Edmund Burke III and many others, uh, that uh, of course there are dissidents uh, in, in the academy, but we also have to look, when we look at that question of truth and humility, um, it's so important. And I think the knowledge factory has really corrupted that and forced us into chasing our own tales and, and engaging in writing that is, in, in the Anglophonic world, I would call it cover your ass writing. So every statement you make, you feel like you have to have 16 different references and you need to say, well, not this, but this. And, and, and I think that that's absolutely corrosive. And I would go so far as to say that even some of uh, supposedly progressive academics in saying, well, we don't need this masculine voice has reinforced that and fit in very readily with us. Yes, masculinism is corrosive and part of the problem. No question about it. Uh, at the end of the day, that critique often means that we can't say anything big about anything big. And they completely misread somebody like Donna Haraway, who is always saying big things. She's always making big statements about big processes as uh, saying, well, you know, the God trick and all this. No, I mean, the point of the God trick is that's uh, that's the, the mechanism of bourgeois thought and knowledge. 
um, which is concrete, concretized very early on in the cartographic and shipbuilding revolutions of early capitalism. So we need to weave these moments together so that we're not just always chasing our tail. Like I'm not coming on here to say, look, I've discovered this truth. See, they are etched onto stone tablets. Accept the truth. No, as I say, the first line of, of, the, uh, of uh, capitalism in the web of life is this is a conversation. And we need to have more conversations and less of like, let's throw my theory against your theory exercises. I think you, there was something important about models as well that you mentioned now. And uh, I want to eventually give two clarifications for people who are listening or watching. First, bourgeois, I guess, is this class between either the, the proletariat or the, 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 the people who work uh, with their hands. And well, there's no more aristocracy, I guess. So the in-between is the bourgeois class. How do you define the bourgeois? All right. So in the simplest possible terms, uh, we have a capitalist class and a working class. Now, are there intermediate classes? Yes, absolutely. Although there's a lot of confusion about that. Well, what I want to then say immediately is that from a dialectical, historical, geographical perspective, these are tendencies. So the tendency of capitalism is towards a world of the owners of capital and the property less who must work for capital. Capitalism will never get to that point uh, for a crucial uh, reason I uh, discussed in World Ecology in our book, Seven Cheap Things, but also in Capitalism and the Web of Life, um, that capitalism relies on unpaid work. The unpaid work of humans, what I call the femitariat, and the unpaid work of webs of life as a whole, what I call, following Stephen Collis, the biotariot. And so there is a dialectical uh, process of proletariat, femitariat, biotariot. Those are not separate categories. So people always say, oh, more is just equating the work of a forest with the work of um, the, the housewife with the work of the factory uh, uh, laborer. No. These are differentiated moments of a singular unity that form and reform across long historical periods. Which you so, also call externalities yeah. and visibilities, right? These uh, so, so ideologically, possible. right, there's a, exactly, there's a, ideologically and ecological economics of, uh, for, for now uh, 80 years since William Cap in 1951, certainly, and, and probably earlier, have talked about how capitalism is a system of unpaid cost. That's absolutely right. What we, we uh, in world ecology take that one step further. We say that capitalism is a system of unpaid work. That for every, and this is very important if we want to understand um, the climate crisis, is what I call the disproportionality thesis. Let me explain that for every unit of work that is done within the cash economy. So the factory worker, the office worker, et cetera, it requires a disproportionately larger inflow of unpaid work and of the unpaid work of humans and the rest of nature. And that's very, very significant because that's not only how capitalism is in a crisis today, and you can see it in all sorts of economic data, productivity data, but is also how capitalism has historically resolved its crises. Now, who are the agents of resolving those crises? Uh, they are the capitalist classes in the imperialist countries. What do they do? They build empires. Today, we hear a lot about settler colonialism, colonialism, and most people discuss it as if it's somehow separate from capitalism, and especially as if it's somehow separate from class. Uh, that is, to say the least, extremely misleading. Imperialism, colonialism is how the imperial bourgeoisie prefers to wage the class struggle. What is the ambition or the goal of those class struggles? To secure cheap natures, which can we can break down into four moments, what I call the four chiefs of labor, including unpaid work. So think about the long history of slaving, slavery, uh, coerced labor all around the world, uh, food, energy, raw materials. Are other combinations possible? Perhaps, but we can say this for sure, that no major accumulation crisis in the history of capitalism has been resolved without a critical substantial reduction in the cost of these four chiefs, which reflect not only the power of money, but also the power of empires to secure unpaid work.
And that's really, really fundamental when we think today about climate justice politics. So if we go back to the bourgeois, because sorry, we did we manage to, to answer somehow because we said, you know, we have the two opposites of the spectrum mm -hmm. and where do they sit? So, okay, so, so think of the, this is very crude, but in uh, uh, the bourgeoisie is today's 1%. And the bourgeoisie emerges and in fact emerges tentatively, unevenly, like all social processes, like urbanization, right, um, uh, in uh, the long 16th century. That is essentially the two centuries after 1450. And it was not this story of, well, a new bourgeoisie comes and displaces the old feudal aristocracy. Sometimes it does, but in many other cases, aristocrats morphed into the owners of capital. Almost always, and everyone agrees on this from Robert Brenner to Emanuel Wallerstein, these dynamics of class formation, the, the formation of a class of owners, a bourgeoisie, uh, was politically enabled, right? So let's not imagine this as an economic story of ingenious hmm. and thrifty Englishmen or, uh, well, Englishmen is the usual story and a very misleading story. Uh, then they eventually accumulate enough capital and, every, and then the, there's a breakthrough to the Industrial Revolution. That's about as false and misleading a story as we can possibly get. Uh, and that means that we, so we think we can think heuristically, and I wanna be clear, heuristically of a class of owners and then those who are compelled to work. Now, the classic Marxist version is those who are severed from the land. And that's if you read Marx on primitive accumulation, that's what you tend to think about. But there are the, in the colonial world, in fact, the story was often the opposite of politically uh, enforcing a relationship to the land so that labor could be sent out from those villages into the centers of commodity production. This is, for instance, the famous Rundale system in Ireland, which was um, a labor reserve. In sub-Saharan Africa in the colonial era, uh, this was a, a fundamental concern of anti-colonial critics. In the Andes in the late 16th and 17th centuries, the Spaniards undertook to reorganize the whole population into villages so they could supply labor to the mines. So I say this to remind the listeners that for a dialectical Marxism, these statements are heuristic. That is, they are about processes and they are about helping us learn more about what actually happened. They are not formal definitions of reality. So you have a class of owners and then a class um, who are compelled to work um, sometimes through the cash nexus, but often unpaid. And this is why dynamics of climate apartheid and climate patriarchy are so important, uh, that it is a configuration of paid and unpaid work that extends not just to humankind and the labor uh, that humans perform for capital and for the accumulation of wealth as capital, but also to the biosphere as a whole. Hence, the there is a planetary proletariat, working class, a planetary proletariat of proletariat thematariat biotariot. And those moments, each one depends on the other. And that's a very difficult intellectual shift, not because it's so complicated, but because everything in the modern world teaches us to think in a completely different way. Yeah. Um, so if someone is looking through the different concepts and words we, we've used so far, capital comes in, nature comes in, class comes in, and Marx comes in. Marx is kind of the cornerstone of many colleagues as well. And I'm wondering, did he really revolutionize something? Why is he such a pivotal moment and helps or enables so much of the radical thought? Is it just because of recognizing you know, the, the class struggles and differentiating elements and all of that? Or, or why is he such a, you know, uh, an element on or a foundation upon we build to, to say other things? And perhaps a, a slight continuation of this question is as well, you know, the we're going to go to the metabolism question right after that. Oh, eventually, fine. yeah, eventually you might want to already start. And Marx helps us with that as well. Yeah, right? correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Marx and Engels come onto the scene, essentially they're the right people at the right time. 
Yeah. Right. The historical circumstances have ripened. Uh, let's remember what's happening in the 1840s and 50s in continental Europe. This is the moment at which large scale industry has begun to uh, employ large numbers of workers across Western Europe. There's also the impact of the Napoleonic Wars and the imposition of bourgeois norms across Central and Western Europe at this time, and the growth of, well, a bourgeoisie that we were just talking about, the owners of capital, which all promotes uh, a, a level of questioning, uh, a level of political possibility, of course, encapsulated in the 1848 revolutions and the Communist Manifesto is one key expression. So it's not simply this sort of abstract great man theory or great men theory of, of knowledge. They come onto the scene at a particular moment at which they are able to take the both the Enlightenment sensibilities of the 18th century and also Hegel's dialectics and really begin to see because it's unfolding right be, before their eyes. It's like living in Shenzhen mm. over the past 30 years. You could not escape the, uh, uh, the spread of capitalist industry and the revolutionizing, not just of industry, but of cities uh, and with cities, of course, the transportation networks Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, so they were in the right place at the right time to begin to articulate a method. For me, why why are Marx and Engels so useful? Because of what I just said, that word method. So, not method in the way that we get taught in in PhD studies, much of which I find to be not very useful. There are some technical facilities like GIS or or regressions, and 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 those are important and necessary. But they are technical facilities. They are not method in the way that positivism is a method or historical materialism is a method. And what's the virtue of historical uh, materialism? I think ultimately it comes to this question of, of uh, praxis, what Lukács called the standpoint of the proletariat, what I would call the standpoint of the planetary proletariat, but also the incessant, relentless breaking down of dualisms in favor of dialectical connections. Now, let me try to clarify this point because often people think that a dualism is an innocent distinction and it's not. Dualisms in a modern sense are very much rooted in the history of imperialism and class formation during the rise of capitalism. Remember this example I give with Locke. There's a very strict dualism between the indigenous so-called savage and the civilizer, the improver, uh, by the way, this is the language that they learned uh, and the way of seeing the world. The English learned to see the world this way through their subordination of Ireland. So uh, the, people make a lot about uh, the world color line. Uh, I would just remind people, yes, there is indeed a world color line. And to follow Cedric Robinson, it doesn't really always have to do with skin pigment. The Irish were just as black as anyone else as far <laughs> as the English were concerned. So. These dualisms emerge at a practical time. Remember this connection that I made earlier about structures of knowledge and structures of power. Uh, capitalism is not just a mode of production, it's a mode of thought. And that thought essentially fragments the world into two, I'm gonna use a big sort of hyper intellectual word here, two ontogenetic units. So ontogenetic meaning they form internally to each other. I mean, to, not to each other, but within each node. So nature and society. These form more or less independently within each other. And then they go and interact in the model of billiard balls. Uh, it's not just limited to uh, nature and society. The, the, one of the defining principles of dualism is the radical evacuation of properties from one to the other. So think about gender, masculine, feminine, that everything historic, this has been problematized lately, and so it's a good example, that everything that was masculine was uh, uh, different from that which was feminine. And so that's an example of the radical exclusionary and the radical evacuation of properties uh, between each node. Now that's a bit of a philosophical discussion, but it should be familiar if we go down the line of, of the West and the rest, of white and not white, of civilized and savage, and on and on and on. The great political philosopher Val Plumwood uh, goes down this list that must have 20 items on it. And she calls it the logic of colonialism. She would do better to call it the logic of capitalism and the logic of modern class power, which of course involves colonialism. 
So we want to understand that that's a dualism. And I wonder if some of the critics maybe just don't understand either the philosophical procedure or the actually existing history. Um, and let's just pause for a moment when we think about working peoples and anti-colonial struggles across the long durée. And one of the things that we hear again and again and again, maybe readers are familiar with, for example, Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. And one of the, the, the expressions that we hear again and again and again from the very beginning of capitalism is that these human beings are being dehumanized. I want us just to pause for a moment for what that means. If they're being dehumanized, they're actually being naturalized. They're being, and, and I'll get to the significance of that in a moment. This sounds like a philosophical point, but I think that may, maybe I'm hoping that the, the political import of this is coming across. So that the struggle for liberation has been a struggle to be recognized as human against the backdrop of being dehumanized, that is suffering the practical expression of the philosophical movement of being radical, of having all the properties of human evacuated from, from your group, whether it's gender or uh, indigenous peoples or particular groups of Africans, et cetera. Sylvia Federici in her history of early uh, capitalism says that women were transformed into, and I quote, the savages of Europe. That's a great example. Think of the taming of the shrew. That's the violence of dualism. And so I hear radicals saying, no, dualism is okay. I don't think that they are appreciating either the philosophical point or the historical realities of how bourgeois ideology and civilizing ideologies, what they've called the civilizing project, it uses dualism as essentially a conceptual hammer of empire that justifies and enables expropriations and slaving and frankly, mass murder. And so I'm not saying those, the people who use these words are therefore complicit in that. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that, that dualism in a way, short circuits are mm. his, our thirst for historical understanding. And the Academy tells us again and again, like find some concept you can use and then publish an article about that. Is that really what we need in the era of climate crisis? So in any event, this is the point that, that Marxism, I think is most useful because it links the, the real development of the class struggle in a historical nitty gritty sense with ways of seeing the world and tries to inform each other. So this is different from other approaches that use dialectics or use relational thinking, but are very anti-Marxist. Uh, for instance, Latour's work, and we see where that's led with Latour um, back to um, you know defense of the European homeland. So uh, uh, these are really crucial intellectual questions that might seem far removed from political struggles, but they're not. So one of the dialectical elements that he uses, Marx, and of course, which is central to this podcast as well, is the, the metaphor of metabolism that actually the word came just some years before he wrote The Capital. So it's it's kind of funny that he latched on, you know, new philosophical ideas, new terms as well, and all of that. Wow. You mentioned in, in your book as well that he, it can be understood from different vantage points, the uh, uh, the, his use of the term metabolism from the metabolic rift or from you know the, the social ecology and all of that. Could you a bit elaborate about his use of the term and how do you use it? Well, I think Marx understood he uses the term social metabolism. And social metabolism in Marx's sense does not mean the metabolism of nature and society. I think what it means is something very close to how he narrates the labor process, the first, that first crucial passage or page of the labor process chapter in Capital. And forgive the, the kind of nitty gritty here, but it's been subject to so much misunderstanding that I want to try to make this as clear as I possibly can. And so what he's describing in Capital with the labor process is this environment making dynamic where the laborer transforms environments, the environments transform the laborer, and the labor process itself is at the center. Now, the chapter is called the labor process. What's very interesting 
is that for, for us in world ecology and for, for some others as well, there is a metabolic process that is a labor process that includes, to use these terms I'm playing around with, proletariat and bioterriot. There's a flow. There's a metabolic process that is a labor process, and I'm not trying to collapse one to the other. The, the, one, of the, one of the great contributions of Marxism is that it moves through variation, not in spite of variation. That it always looks for differences and unities and unities and differences, and sometimes it's more successful than others. So there's a metabolic process. The metabolic process is indeed a differentiated moment of the unities of class society, which include class, which include a mode of accumulation, not necessarily capitalism, all modes of production and modes of accumulation, forms of state uh, formation. Scott calls these state, state landscaping dynamics. There is uh, a metabolism to them all. So in other words, class societies don't have a metabolism, they are metabolisms. And there are specific metabolic arrangements that are irreducible to uh, uh, political and class dynamics. Why are they ir irreducible? Because webs of life are qualitatively distinct and contain um, what I call the oikos, the pulse of life making that is itself deeply active. And so for me, I, I've, I always love the concept of, of metabolism in, in a dialectical sense. I've written about this quite a bit. Uh, um, I think that there are many roads to enlightenment. I am convinced by my, my uh, uh, argument for metabolism, which is historical, geographical, involves human labor, as well as the work of uh, extra human natures. Um, I think that that's a very useful way, but I think there are other fruitful approaches. And uh, suffice it to say, for those other approaches, they have been uh, not so charitable, that for them, academic sectarianism and perhaps Marxist sectarianism uh, takes precedence. Yeah, it's, I think one of the first uh, things I read when I was doing my master's thesis, something about urban metabolism, I, I read the, the history a bit about the term and uh, through uh, Marina Fischer Kowalski mentioning that it was through Marx. And for me, that was you know, a, a nice insight. I never went and read precisely what it meant, neither understood it. So for me, for it wasn't the back burner for a very, very long time that sure he dabbled with it, but what precisely he meant, I think still to this day slightly eludes me, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting a, a better grasp, uh, you know, every day. And then uh, in urban yeah. studies, this has long been a major point, going back to Abel Woolman, and I'm yeah, sure correct. even earlier. Of course, yeah. Um, and, and so the, the, the distinctions, the conversation is between more technical renderings of the term and social renderings uh, of the concept. And, and they're related too, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, there, it's such a prolific playground as well that is, it's very interesting. It's also very, you know, made <laughs> when you were uh, talking about making the environment uh, it's kind of this this entity that is made uh, by the day and it, i find it just, uh, really fascinating um eventually let's try to to have a last question but it might lead us to, <laughs> to some uh, interesting place so let's imagine that uh, through word history you you pick up hints right along the way you, you see pieces that that tell you okay the the, the past and the the present is a continuum um do you find or have you find any hints saying that we might be at the end of capitalism and something else is coming up uh or what should be we should be looking at if there is something to be looked at when we talk about you know such a big container well i think a century or two or three from now we will say uh, either that capitalism by this point in 2022 was already done or we'll say that it, it had at best a few more years left in it now what do we mean by that i think we need to be specific so capitalism is above all a system and a strategy of accumulation premised on cheap natures 
cheap natures include labor, food, energy, raw materials, and we can throw other cheaps in there as Raj Patel and I have in our book. Every great wave of uh, growth was preceded by a great accumulation crisis. This goes all the way back to the great military and financial crises of uh, the late 1550s. There's a long history of capitalist resolution of very concrete economic and political crises. So we should ask, how did capitalist agencies, empires, classes, financial systems, et cetera, uh, resolve those crises? Well, they went to frontiers uh, with uh, soldiers with guns, priests with Bibles, accountants with their ledgers, planters with uh, exotic crops like sugarcane, and they, they succeeded in mobilizing a critical mass of cheap labor, food, energy, and raw materials. Uh, why is that so important for capitalism? Because capitalism is a system of accumulation. And if you reduce the cost of the basic inputs, all things being equal, you increase the rate of profit. Now, that's a very schematic way of putting it, but it's very crucial to remember. What's happening today? There are no more frontiers of cheap nature. Mm. Now, what we're seeing with increasing force across the past 50 years and virtually every major intervention, radical intervention in uh, um, over capitalism over the past 40 years has said this, that there is a dynamic of politically enforced redistribution of wealth and power going on in the neoliberal era. And so this is uh, Vandana Shiva's biopiracy. This is Naomi Klein's shock doctrine. This is Harvey's accumulation by dispossession. This is Sasson's predatory accumulation. We want to really pause for a moment and ask about the ferocity, the scale, the scope, the speed of primitive accumulation in this era, which has failed to do what? To essentially reestablish the conditions for a new long wave of accumulation. How do we know this? Well, I'm sure we could spend a whole day talking about this, but let me just give you two great indicators. One is the non-appearance of a new labor productivity revolution that was widely anticipated in the 1970s, right? Alvin Toffler, Future Shock, uh, Ernest Mandel in late capitalism, we're all seeing this. A new wave of automation will unleash a new wave of labor productivity and establish the conditions for a new uh, uh, golden age of capitalism, one that never appeared. We did not, in fact, get the robot factory. Instead, we got the global sweatshop. So no robot factories, lots of sweatshops. That's the model, right? To redistribute wealth and power, to widen inequality, and to deal, and then to financialize again and again and again, and also dangerously, and we see this today, financialization over the past 50 years has really turned on militarization. And we want to really grasp how horrific that is. And there's a, a strategic and umbilical cord, if you will, that's Harvey's term, between finance and militarization that I think much of the academic left has just stuck their heads in the metaphorical sand about. Uh, it's quite horrific. And it, it's, it's related to, of course, America's drive for unipolar hegemony, a project now in shambles. And so we want to make sense of, of these dynamics. But in any event, you have this long-term labor productivity stall out. People like Jason Smith and Aaron Benevov have recently uh, uh, written great books about this. There's also, it's related to climate, but not reducible to climate. And this speaks directly to a more palpable sense of, of metabolism, a long-term deceleration in agricultural productivity growth. So uh, biotech revolutions failed to provide a, the basis for a new agricultural revolution. There's the ongoing drive into Amazonia, into the tropical rainforest of Borneo, other places like that. But that's nothing like the opening of great agricultural frontiers in previous eras. There's no prospect of a revival either of agricultural productivity growth or of labor productivity growth. Of course, with agriculture, climate yield suppression is real, has already been going on now for several decades. Um, uh, uh, Ortiz, uh, uh, let's see, I'm going to mess up Ortiz Bobea and her colleagues in the, the journal Nature Climate Change published a piece last year saying that fully eight years of agricultural productivity growth had been lost already because of climate change. And we know what's coming. So that implies uh, that the essentially the core of capitalism 
is not just endless accumulation, but the way that it's secured what Gramsci calls the general interest is by building out these successive productivity revolutions. It can't do that right now. So now we are back to an economic and political version of what Lenin glimpsed um, during World War I, uh, the wars of redivision. And I hesitate to say so, but we see those tendencies breaking out all around us. And uh, if we're following events in Taiwan and Ukraine, and those are not the only flashpoints, that should give us pause. So we wanna be able to understand that capitalism right now, in my view, is really a zombie civilization. It's walking, but it's dead, all right? Now, that doesn't mean that the world in 50 years will look completely and totally different. Tributary mm. civilizations, those in which politics are in command, imagine a scenario where the ruling classes of the world essentially take the logic of too big to fail. Mm -hmm. That logic of financial bailout to its logical extreme that basically puts explicitly political power in the driver's seat of capital accumulation and guarantees a certain limited capital accumulation model without the intensity of the anarchy of production in Marx's sense. That would be a tributary solution. Think about tribute, tributary solution to the present crisis. That's entirely possible. Any positive alternative <laughs> as you can see? Well, I think the positive alternatives are all around it's again, I think, a, largely a question again of the parable of the blind men and the elephant. Mm. That uh, there are prefigurative politics all around that are extraordinarily powerful and useful. I've uh, written about food sovereignty in La Via Campesina. I think there are extraordinary moments there. I think there are prefigurative moments in some, not all, but some of degrowth and Green New Deal uh, discourses and politics. I think there are uh, very hopeful elements. I would say uh, even in China's challenge to American unipolar hegemony, I would say there are, uh, uh, we can look not just in the US, but I'm, I'm here and it's very striking, a resurgence of working class struggles for the first time since the early 1970s. It's at a very low level. So all of these, uh, you know, radicals love to sort of blow these uh, up into, oh, here's some new great model, right? Um, so there are lots of, of very powerful experiences. Um, I would say, and it's unpopular to say, even the Venezuelan and Iranian uh, challenges to American unipolar hegemony are instructive. Now, none of these are models. Um, but they are problematic for a neoliberal world order that says there's no alternative. Now, I think a lot of the both activist and, and academic thinking on the left is a bit starry eyed about the prospects of transition. And we tend to see an oscillation between hopelessness and I think overinflated optimism. And they're both, they're, we don't need either. We don't need pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. We need we need optimi intellectual optimism and as well as everything else. Um, but we, again, we have to look at history and there's a real denial, especially in the left social democratic programs that have gained some traction in, in Central and Western Europe and in North America. There's uh, a real historical blind spot because none of them look at what happened at the most recent high tide of left-wing social democracy in Western Europe in the, the first half of the 1970s. They don't, they don't wanna look at it because it poses uncomfortable questions um, that require, I think, uh, a, really a kind of fearless, a, a fearless assessment of what was happening there. I mean, look at the, I mean, one of my favorite examples is what happens when the left wing I don't want to say a left-wing labor government. Labor government comes into uh, power in Britain in 1974 on the heels of massive working class unrest and the most radical social program of uh, the 20th century in any major capitalist democracy. And uh, there's, uh, uh, there's been a lot of literature uh, um, on this, but essentially what we see is the security apparatus, the United States, the International Monetary Fund, 
all collude and collide and, uh, with each other, including the British Army, which does surprised, unannounced to the Prime Minister's <laughs> office, um, military exercises that close down Heathrow three times after Labour is elected, four times in 1974, one just before the election. And remember, this is in the era of, uh, of, of Allende's coup. Uh, this is just after the horrific events in Indonesia in the mid 60s of third world fascism across the world. So this is a very um, instructive moment. Now, uh, you know, the dirty tricks have not stopped. The role of internal security states and their articulation with uh, uh, tech capital has not stopped. Uh, the you know uh, so we have we have a very difficult situation when we want to be optimistic and I am optimistic I think that none of these will succeed but I think also that we need to take very seriously um, essentially the motto of imperialist powers against any challenger not just socialist but any nationalist project in the 20th century was essentially in order to save the village it became necessary to destroy it. And that, that we, have to, we have to be very serious about this and not go into, well, let's just have transition towns and more farmers markets and do the right kind of urban planning. I think all of those are important. All of those are necessary. Um, but what do we do uh, when uh, we want to wrest control of the savings and investment mechanism, which everybody knows at some level will be necessary if the cities are going to be rebuilt and the infrastructures are going to be rebuilt in a democratic, egalitarian, and sustainable way. Yeah. Is there any last elements you would like to, to address? Something that we, we've we touched upon and we haven't developed, something you wanted to, to discuss? Well, I think that that last point really mm -hmm. knits together the technical and the political. And that is where urban metabolism, urban political ecology approaches. I think planetary urbanization opens it up in powerful ways. There are other approaches as well. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to the work of Neil and, and Neil Brenner and his colleagues on this point that there are technical and political moments that have to be fused together in order to really reconstruct the world. And that's what's going to be necessary. We all recognize this at some level. We talk about sea level rise. Well, it's not just cities that will have to be moved inland. It's also energy plants. It's infrastructures of every kind. And how are those going to be rebuilt? And so during the Chinese revolution, Mao would talk about red and expert, that we, you know, to rebuild a country that had been destroyed by a fascist empire, uh, uh, expertise was needed to rebuild the country, the health system, the urban system, manufacturing, everything, but it also had to be read. It had to be oriented towards questions of justice and equality. And I would add to that, that in the moment of climate crisis, a revolutionary politics will have to be green, red, and expert. Any uh, books or articles or films that you would like to recommend that might help us uh, look at this uh, green, red, and uh, expert. Uh, you know, shiats. that's, a, that's. I'm sure I'm doing injustice to to uh, somebody and blanking on on that. Who is who is fusing these questions? You know, that's, that's really important to pose. And I, I fear that I don't have a good answer. And maybe we can, uh, maybe we can, maybe someone will occur to us, or maybe we can even find ways to build out those discussions because I think it's of the utmost political importance uh, to do, you know, not just, you know, and it's not just a question of nationalizing, uh, you know, the, the contractors and the real estate developer. It's not just a question of that. It's a question of, yes, socializing them under democratic and worker control, right? So what, is, what does a worker's democracy approach to urbanization in the era of climate crisis mean? And that involves very difficult technical questions. I have, I have so much admiration. I get so much inspiration from urban thinkers who are really wrestling with uh, not just the broader politics and political economy, but how in an engineering sense, in a, built, in a concrete built environment sense, are 
people housed, our, our community areas built, our, uh, our, our zones of production and reproduction articulated or not. Th these are really important technical questions that cannot be collapsed into each other. We need, again, a unity and difference, a difference in unity. And that's what's really hard to find in the academy at this point. What's happening, and this is something that I hope resonates with some of your listeners, what's happening is that instead of universities widening and opening up big questions that stress the interrelations, they are looking for more and more narrow technical specific specializations. And that's precisely what we don't need at this moment. That's not to say if you have a very technically oriented specialization, that's unimportant. It is, it's very important. There has to be a, a balance. And um, the fact that there's not is a real problem. So I would say, let's, I mean, my, my really the capstone to this is look at the history of the Holocene, look at the history of capitalism and look at how class and politics states and urban spaces are all forming and reforming each other and producing uh, webs of life, but also being shaped by those webs of life. Well, thanks so much, Jason. I think uh, it gives me new breath for, for the podcast, the, this last sentences about you know, what we need to do and what are the specificities and generalities and, and uh, new pathways of, uh, of interrogations for the future. It's Thanks been a so much. pleasure and an honor to talk with you. It's really, really been fun and lively. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. And thanks to everyone uh, for listening uh, and, you know, understanding all of these complex processes until the end. I'm sure that if you enjoyed this episode, you probably will also enjoy, well, we mentioned them here. So the, the episode with uh, Neil Brenner and Nikos Katsikis on uh, planetary urbanization and also on urban political ecology with Eric Swingedow and Matthew Gante. So once again, thanks to you all and see you in two weeks for another episode. Thank you. Cheers.